Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Gordon. I am the president of the Westlake Village Art Guild, and we are absolutely thrilled to have James Griffith here tonight. And he's also got um, Craig Kroll with him, who is the gallery owner of uh, Bergamont Station, which I'm sure you guys have all heard of. And I believe that's how the two of these guys met. I'm gonna let them tell you more of the story, the process, the everything. And so I will go ahead and let you take it away, James. Thank you so much for doing this for us. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just uh, pleased to be here with you. Uh, Craig is my, my gallery dealer and his gallery is at Bergamont Station and I'm eternally grateful to be a part of his organization. Um, uh, the thing that makes my work most unusual is that I paint with tar that I collect from the La Brea tar pits. And uh, I'm gonna uh, show you some of the processes I do with that tar, how I essentially turn it into paint and make all this work that's here in my studio. You get to see little bits and pieces and I'll show you some of the, the strange methods that I uh, use to, to make the work. Um, people always wonder uh, how did I decide to work with the tar? Um, how do I get it? Well, I used to make traditional oil paintings and they were um, landscape based. They were about nature. And uh, I, was, I was frustrated really when it comes down to it with the expense because I was spending a fortune on, on oil paints. And I was just scratching my head. There must be some alternatives to this. And when I found a can of asphaltum on my studio shelf, it had been there since I had done printmaking in college. I thought, I'm just gonna experiment with this stuff and see what it does. Asphaltum is tar, but it's been mixed with uh, varnishes and dryers so that uh, a printmaker can put it on a copper plate and etch through it then it will be put into a bath of acid and where they scratched away, it bites and becomes a printing plate. So it does dry and I thought, well, that's sort of like paint, I'll get involved in it. One day as I was experimenting, a friend came over and said, hey James, you can get that stuff for free at the Grand Tarpins. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that changes everything, not because it's free, but because the history of the La Brea Tar Pits. It just uh, moved me to my very soul to think I could paint with something that was that ancient and that full of history. So I called them up and said, please, oh. may I have some? And they said, yes, how much would you like? And so uh, let me show you how much they gave me. This, this here bucket, five gallons, like you get paint in the paint store, is uh, filled with this incredible substance. And it is uh, incredibly viscous a little bit smelly. Uh, it is just super fun to play with. And that alone is probably enough to make me want to paint with it forever. And uh, it comes with material because it's so <laughs> This, this material was actually once alive. Um, in this map you might see back here, that little pink triangle is pointing to the La Brea tar pits. And it totally amazes me that this portal to the Pleistocene age 
is right in the center of Los Angeles on the Miracle Mile. And it's not out in the desert. You don't have to trek on horseback to go see it. You can just drive your car to the LA County Museum and the Brea Tarkins and see some of this stuff in action. James, is that the the form that it's in when they take it out of the pits, or do you have yeah, to treat it to make it more silky and smooth, or is it? This is the raw material as it comes out of the pit, and the reason they take it out of the pit is because they're making a well into a lake of tar, so they're diking it back and the dike always leaks. And so they are bailing it out constantly. And they bail it out with these five gallon tubs. And uh, they were happy to uh, give me some because it's really a, a problem for them. They have to get rid of it and it's a toxic material and it's quite, quite a thing to get rid of it all. And so my getting it wasn't really a problem at all. And they're very, very sweet. I, I highly recommend getting to know the people at the La Brea Tar Pits because they're, they're truly wonderful. Actually, you can walk around the park and if you're not careful, you can step in, step in it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It bubbles up everywhere. It's not just in the pit. In fact, the golf course down the street has trouble with the tar coming up everywhere. And they said, if I can't get it from the La Brea Tar Pits, I can just go to the golf course. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now you say it's toxic is it okay to be working with well it it is smelly i wouldn't recommend eating it but uh, it, uh it's um it's not so dangerous to work with in and of itself the thing i have to be careful with is the solvents that i use to uh thin it and i'll describe just briefly what i do this is a, a container that I use that I've mixed up into asphalt I'm using this. And I use um, things like uh, copal, uh, copal painting medium that you would use. You can buy this at Blick. Uh, uh, cobalt dryers, that sort of thing. And I mix that also with <clears throat> Damar varnish. And I make these mixes to make sort of a, a basic uh, asphaltum, like I was describing they use for printmaking. But then I can thin it with everything from mineral spirits, uh, terpenoid, uh, gasoline. I keep a little tiny canister of gasoline for certain things. Uh, I use Zippo lighter fluid. And uh, I've got lots of fans and ventilation and masks that I wear when I'm doing this. So the, uh, that part of the process I won't demonstrate tonight. I don't want to put Craig at risk. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be doing some things that, that uh, show you how I manipulate it to get it onto the canvases. Um, I guess we can just start right away with uh, when when you go to a print, print studio, printmaking studio, they have big inking wheels or uh, uh, brayers, brayers, you know, the kind of thing that you can use for doing a woodblock printing, if you've ever done that in a class. And these big rollers, these big rollers that they use, I'm cheapskate, and uh, I didn't want to spend all the money to buy those things. So I found when I looked up online, I could get rollers like this uh, on eBay. They're industrial conveyor belt rollers, and instead of paying 350 bucks for a, a comparable roller, uh, this one only cost me 20. Yes. And so I've got a whole, whole bunch of them. I even use sometimes. <clears throat> little um, rolling pins. And what I'm going to show you, I'm digging into my pit of asphaltum, 
in this stage, it's not quite as runny as it was in the original pot. Uh, and part of that is temperature. We're, where are we now? In a very cold March. And uh, in the summertime, everything flows a little bit more. But I've got my roller and I collect these old mirrors because they make uh, terrific rolling surfaces and I just roll out the material with these rollers and there's a whole range of, of textures you can get depending on how much you roll it out, how thin the surface is. I can uh, use uh, the tool to create gradations where it might be um, darker in the center and soft edged on the sides, which is a very <laughs> heavy staged. As I even it out here. Now, let's see, I think I'll use this guy here. Now this one, this is a good one. I'll show you in a minute how I prepare a panel like this but basically, this is a blank panel. Uh, you can see it's got some coloration. And the way that uh, it's, uh, the material that it's made out of uh, is an aluminum panel that's been primed like a, you'd spray a car, you'd prime a car, a metal car, and then I paint it. I use titanium white, uh, Windsor Newton titanium white. I used to use another paint uh, that had zinc mixed into it. And since we're, we're talking process here, I, I learned after some years, as I noticed that my paintings were starting to crack, um, I researched it and discovered that zinc paint will crack uh, more, more readily than titanium. And so uh, there's a phrase certain paint geeks use, uh, Friends don't let friends use zinc. <laughs> you use titanium instead. But if we can focus down here for a second, <clears throat> I'm gonna just take this roller and roll it across and post it on the floor. <clears throat> roll it across the surface. And you can see the kind of textural surface I'm getting is not just what I'm applying, but what I'm applying it to. So it's quite calligraphic. Uh, there's a lot of gesture in that white paint that was uh, you know, totally dry, but as this roller goes over it, it sort of draws itself. And I love that uh, natural aspect to my work. I depend a great deal on natural events that I curate rather than intend. So I didn't plan this mark, it just happened. And so it's like nature. But I can edit it and say, I'm going to feature that mark, or I'm going to uh, erase that mark. So I'm in control and not in control all at the same time. I love that. Now, another thing I did is um, when I'm Preparing a panel like this, I use a tool that is appropriate. Uh, I used to use palette knives that you'd buy in an art store, but it occurred to me that um, one of my favorite artists is uh, Courbet back in the 1800s, and he did beautiful uh, palette knife paintings. And I try and imitate those. 
But uh, what I liked about it was his sort of workman attitude towards the paint that really emphasized the material. And I'm, that's a theme that will go through all the work I'll show you tonight. I'm really interested in letting the material speak. And so I'm approaching the, the painting, even in this early stage, uh, like a person who's troweling a, um, a drywall uh, wall to their building, or I use this tool also to build uh, cement steps or sidewalks. So what I do here in this case to, here's my Windsor Newton, I just love this step. It's like the tar in reverse, it's white. <laughs> I just spoodle out a whole bunch of it. Take my trowel, get the trowel fully loaded. And at this point, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But I just let it happen. And it, if you can catch any of the, the reflection on this, I'm not sure, but it's very gestural and uh, very uh, physical. And I, I need to have that physicality in my work. I need there to be something that's sort of uh, strong and, and basic and, and not at all fine. I, it's not about fine art at this stage. It's about material art. And oh my God, it looks sort of like the ocean if you can see that at all. Um, but um, it's, it's going to be uh, beautiful once I roll the tar on it. This, however, is going to dry for at least two weeks before I can touch it again. So <clears throat> it's another reason why I won't be finishing a painting that I start tonight at the end of an hour and a half, <laughs> because we'd have to just sit and watch paint dry. <clears throat> Let's go over here to the tray. I want to show uh, for a moment some fine work that contrasts with what we've just seen. Um, my primary drawing tool are uh, X-Acto knives. Uh, this is something that, again, I didn't plan or even know I was going to do when I started working with tar. It took me a couple of years to think of it. And, oh, I can draw with an X-Acto knife blade. So let me demonstrate that. This is a, another aluminum panel. And what I've done here that is uh, just another stage beyond what you just saw is I made a simple stencil. In this case, it's of a rabbit. There's his ears. And with that stencil laying down on the board, I took that ruler and I rolled out the tar till I got, oops, a silhouette, <laughs> messy. And uh, in order to get the detail on there, I've made a drawing of, of the rabbit and uh, I'm now going to transfer that simply using an X-Acto knife blade. And all I'm doing is cutting through this tracing paper. Tracing paper, I use so much that I buy it in large rolls. And there's always a, a big roll lying around somewhere in the studio because it is one of the main uh, forms of breathing is tracing with tracing paper. So I'm simply cutting through all the line work. And I had a teacher back when I was in school at Art Center, College of Design in Pasadena, who was a really successful commercial painter. 
he did a lot of illustration. And he said, uh, whenever he's tracing and redrawing, because he would trace and redraw and trace and redraw, he never tried to get the lines exactly right because he said, I might get it better this next time. And so I'm never that precise. I'm just trying to get the general proportion and location of all the bits. We were talking earlier um, about copying uh, imagery. And you might wonder, well, where did he get this image of a rabbit? Uh, rabbits are really important to me because when I grew up in Long Beach, uh, I grew up at a time when there was a lot of vacant land still in Long Beach. And there were a lot of wild rabbits. And as a little boy, I did what little boys do. I tried to catch the rabbits and I never did. And uh, the thing though, that I still remember to this day is um, the confrontation I would have with a few of those rabbits. They were the first wild animals that I ever met face to face. And that was truly a, a memorable experience. It has influenced me. But now it's the rabbits aren't around me anymore. So I use a lot of photographic um, material that I might collect on the internet. But in my computer, I can look up rabbits. And there's a file that has literally hundreds of rabbits. So when I go to paint a rabbit like this, rather than copying an individual photograph that somebody else took, I'm collecting the best eye, the best ear, the most graphic representation of fur. And I collect all this information together almost till I have memorized it. <clears throat> now, here we are, I've pulled away the thing. There's very little uh, indication yet of where that face is, but I can see it, it's very subtle. But now I've got my tool and I can start scratching away. In this case, drawing white lines instead of dark lines like you would with a pencil. So I'm literally scraping away the layer of tar. And here I am drawing this little animal's eye. I find. James, I wonder if you could do the same thing with paint, or it would be a completely different feel to be scratching it off like that with an exacto knife with paint instead of the tar. Well, I didn't go too much into the, the whole history of tar and how that its history fascinates me. Uh, it's it's about not just the history of the La Brea tar pits to me, it's about the whole history of life on the planet that it, it begins to teach me about. So one of the things that working with tar did for me was a way of opening up research to the very beginning of uh, natural history. And One of the things I found was that when uh, natural history first started in the 1800s, uh, the naturalists made these beautiful wood engravings of animals they found all around the world. Uh, I don't even know what this bird is, a curious adjutant bird. Uh, but what I loved was the engravings themselves and the, the line work that uh, the, the image is built up with. It was a fascinating thing that was happening 
in the 1800s. They had photography, but they uh, couldn't reproduce it well enough in a, a book that was being printed thousands of times to get clear photographs. The technology wasn't there. So they, even though this was probably done from a photograph, um, a guy sat there and made an engraving. And these artists, I think, were incredible, but they're more or less lost to history. There's no uh, museum for the wood engravers of natural history illustrations, but there, there should be. This is a fabulous old book called uh, Explorations and Adventures of Henry M. Stanley, the Stanley. And uh, I just love the, the title page of this book. It says here, uh, the whole comprising a vast treasury of all that is marvelous and wonderful. <laughs> and so uh, um, this also relates to another series we'll look at later where I'm actually using uh, typography in the work. But I brought this up because I wanted to show that I feel a camaraderie with that early naturalist uh, impulse to, to describe an animal in that kind of detail of line work. I like the connection, the reference, the historical reference. But what I discovered is that there's an intimacy that I never had with a paintbrush. There's an intimacy where I can work almost at the level of arranging grains of sand. Um, it's, it's beautiful to look into the eye of the, the animal for such a long time to, to draw the fine detail of it. Another um, thing to begin to indicate hair by hair, the fur and the directionality of the fur as it crosses the form, the, the, the curving undulation of, in this case, I'm drawing the fur onto an ear. Uh, in another case, I can be uh, working across the musculature of the, of the form and, and changing directions. And I just love the, the graphic aspect of working with line and working uh, all my life I drew with pencils and suddenly I'm drawing with white instead of with dark. And I, I find that an interesting reversal. I, I, it, it's a, a, a poetry that's just different and unusual. Um, I don't know how far I, you want me to go with this. Maybe we could just go over and look at something that's more developed. This is a, a painting of one of my neighbors, uh, Greyhounds, a rescue dog. And uh, the, the fur undulates. Hey, James, we're losing the sound on you. I don't know if. Uh... Ah, am, I, am I back? Oh, oh, yeah, that's much better. OK, good. <laughs> I wander sometimes. Um, the, the undulation of this fur across this extraordinary muscular body of this, of this dog uh, was both heaven and hell to make. <laughs> because it is, it is maddening to, to draw hair by hair to describe something. But it is, in my estimation, worth, worth the effort. And uh, you'll see that some of the, the lines are, are white, but some of them have a tone across them. Now, the way that I achieved that is at one time, the entire body of the animal was high contrast, like this, where I've scraped hair by hair to make each one of those lines. And then at a certain point, I've made a stencil 
of the dog and made a very thin application tar. Again, using the conveyor belt rollers, but I add more varnish. So it becomes a very thin and lighter tone. I knock the whole thing down so it casts a shadow across the, the form. And then I come back and hit just the highlights. It's an old master trick that uh, you'll see in Rembrandt or any of those guys where there's just a few hot spots of light, but the whole thing is toned down. So um, there's this procedural process where I'll go mad for a couple of days drawing out the animal and then uh, knock it back down. Um, this, this piece here is basically done. And uh, at one time the background was quite much more busy than it actually is now. And there's a, a beautiful sense of form. You can almost stroke and pet the back of the dog. The one thing that bothers me about this painting is that it's, the eye keeps getting distracted to the form of the dog and not spending enough time with the portrait of the dog. And the reason I think that that happens is because there's not enough contrast here. There's too much distraction. So I'm gonna fix that before your very eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this here is a sheet of plastic and you can buy this at any hardware store and it's uh, sold as shelf paper or some kids used to wrap it around their textbooks so they wouldn't wear out on the cover. I'm gonna put it up here. <clears throat> this is another material that responds to heat. So in the summer, it sticks really well to the paintings. But in the winter like this, when it's probably about 65 in the studio, because I don't have a heater at the moment, I tape it on so it won't fall off. I'm going to quickly just, with my trusty exacto knife, cut this puppy out, as it were. <laughs> and what I'm doing this for is to protect the beauty of the portrait of the dog. Of course, I love the whole painting. So you're making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Now, <clears throat> so I'm peeling away everything except for the dog's head. Now, I'm going to go back over to the titanium white. And I'm going to do basically the same thing I did with the tar. I'm rolling out a thin layer of white paint. The uh, this white paint is, is, maybe you can see that. You see how it's got sort of a hairiness to it? Mm -hmm. That's just the pastiness of it as it rolls out. It's, it pulls it up and I wanna just, Hold that down so it's a, a smoother finish. Now I'm going to point something else out. 
there's a sort of a beige color, I hope you can see, and then lighter colors. This um, is caused by earlier times when I've rolled white across the background. The first time you roll across tar, the paint is a solvent to the tar to some slight degree. And that causes the brown to bleed through. And so I get this particular beige color that the tar is affecting the white paint. But as the white paint dries, the oil seals the tar. So the next layer is whiter. So I'm gonna just roll across here. And what that does for me is it draws my attention to the high contrast of the head against the light so that it balances the intensity of the form of the back of the dog, where I was particularly fascinated with the, the musculature of these dogs because they're runners. They have such dynamic, strong legs. And I highlighted this triangle of light here that points up at its waist. So the eye just kind of was stuck there. And now it's a little more balanced. And- uh, It works, James. The, um, the, the portraiture is important because the, the woman who owns this dog needs to buy this paint. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my motivation there. <laughs> um, it's absolutely beautiful. I, uh, yeah, so two more of the, the shark. The shark here just shows the, the simplicity of carving away with the, the blade. This was simply a brown brown panel and there's no shark there other than just cutting away into the brown panel with the exacto knife blade and uh, I think it really captures some of that quality of those early wood engravings that I discovered in those books from the 1800s. This is a a bear that has visited my home in Altadena here for maybe four years in a row. So I watched it grow from a, a little bear that would just swim in the pool. And then it came back this year with two babies. Oh. And it was such a massive bear. Now it's eaten quite well in Altadena. <laughs> And I wanted to try and capture its, its physicality. Um, I couldn't do that just simply by scratching away the way that uh, I did with the, the Greyhound with the X-Acto knife blade. So it introduced a new tool that I'm using now, which is a belt sander. And uh, I began this, um, this painting using the belt sander on a brown tar ground and uh, slowly just almost like graffiti drawing my idea of a bear with the belt sander. And then <clears throat> when that was completed, I came back with the detail in the face using an exacto knife blade. So it contrasts to really different ways of drawing. And maybe we can go back over here and I'll show you how I do that. I'm curious, James, also, how you get the darks yeah. back in for 
say his nose or his eyes you want darker or do you then put more I, black tar in those places? Exactly. The, the beauty of, of this material, and you'll see it as you see more and more work, is that it, it's totally fluid. It, there is nothing set in stone here. Everything can go lighter, everything can go darker, everything can be erased. Sometimes, um, in fact, how did I start painting with a belt sander? Um, I had a lot of failures. <laughs> and I needed to get rid of the, the surface of the painting entirely. So I just started erasing them with belt sanders. And uh, then I thought, oh my God, this looks pretty good. <laughs> so I started drawing with it. So I'm going to contrast in this, this uh, painting. I'm going to first do something very delicate with a, an X-Acto knife blade. Um, it might be interesting to you to think about how uh, one that adds an image to, to the, the piece. I'm painting in these two paintings images of flames. It's a series of fire. And that means uh, it's very gestural and uh, high contrast. But in this particular painting, I want there to be something burning. So I'm going to add a drawing of a, a bit of a, a branch, a natural branch. I cut this out of a piece of uh, cardstock after making lots of drawings, successes and failures of what I wanted that branch to look like. Came up with one I liked. I decide, okay, I'm gonna place it somewhere over here. I spend a lot of time deciding where it's to go, then I can just use my X-Acto knife blade against that thick edge of the cardstock, and I can get The important thing to me is that the line work is emphatic, that it's not wimpy and hesitant, not wandering around trying to figure out what to do, which probably is what I'm trying to do, <laughs> trying to figure out what to do. But I want it to feel like it's always been there or I knew exactly what I was doing. And so I want that cleanness that working against the heavy cardstock gives me. Now, <clears throat> later on, I'll decide if that, um, that stick should be light or dark, uh, if I need to uh, bring out the lights behind it or the lights on it. I'm not sure at this point. Why am I not sure? Because <laughs> it's time to work on the flame more. So I'm gonna get my belt sander. And I don't know what this is a sound like, but it'll sound like that. <laughs> and the, the belt sander has a platform. And if you uh, really push on it, you can go right down into the aluminum that this thing is, is based on. But I just want to tickle the surface of the, the tar. I just want to give it a little kiss with the belt sander. And you can see <clears throat> that there's a, a directionality to that line work I just added to that. And it sort of funnels up across the form. And I can control that by familiarity, by just simply the direction of it. And when I want to have that funneling go the opposite direction, I have to turn the painting around rather than <laughs> turning the whole body around. So a lot of body mechanics in the way I paint. And so now I have this, this kind of linear 
drawing that quite possibly I could have done with an exacto knife blade, except it would never have the veracity. It would never have the kind of uh, immediacy and, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just, it's just, uh, I don't know, it, it's more, it gets under your skin. It's, it's uh, expressionistic in a way that when I come back with fine detail, um, is completely in contrast. So in this painting here, you can see down at the bottom of the painting, I've painted these two moths and uh, spent a lot of care and tender detail to create the precise form of those moths. And that stands in contrast to the, uh, the form of the flame and the energy of the flame. Rather than making a, a rendering, uh, a photorealistic rendering of flame, I'm trying to capture that, that movement, that gesture that uh, it's a flame never stands still. It's, and it's destroying while we look at it. It's, it's uh, causing something to evaporate into molecules. And so I, I love the way that the, <clears throat> the mechanical drawing emphasizes that form. There's one thing that bothers me about this painting that I'm going to fix. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this might make sense to you, I'm not sure. I love the way that the, the flame comes up to the top here, but uh, there's something about the top edge of this painting that I just don't like. Um, it's too, I don't know, too wimpy or unfocused. And the whole energy of the painting comes up here and leaves me hanging. So I thought a lot about this earlier today. I'm just cutting out a piece of cardstock again and laying it up here on top of that flame. And if I imagine that I had drawn it more like that, what it does is it suddenly draws my attention to its opposite in this dark wedge down here. If I take that away, my eye just sort of wanders off. And strangely, even though it's a big arrow pointing off, there's a relationship between those two things. It also creates kind of an onion dome form here that really focuses the painting for me. So what I'm gonna do is just etch flame out and get rid of that tar. And you can see um, in this case, there's very shiny, uh, heavy textural tar here. And that's because I put a lot of varnish into it and it's flaking off in lumps. Lumps the sides of a grain of sand, of course. And uh, cleaning up the edge a little bit. This is so different than other lectures I've given about my work because you're apparently more interested in watching paint dry. Like, <laughs> I just, I love watching paint dry. But um, the, the beauty of getting to know an instrument that uh, isn't standardized, like drawing with an exacto knife, is it takes you a while to realize you can rotate it like you do maybe with a sharpened pencil. You can draw with the side of a pencil or the point or all sorts of different angles to it. Well, now I'm drawing with the backside of the, 
the blade where it's just at its finest. And James, and, all of a sudden you realize, oops, I took off too much. I didn't mean to do that. You can just bring what, a brush with some tar and fill it back in? I could. I could stick my finger in it and rub it on perhaps. You see my hands are a little bit dirty. Um, but there's, let's just say an infinite number of ways I could make that area darker or lighter. And uh, the range is described somewhat by these two instruments. Once again, that's an improvement. You did yeah. make the right choice. Yeah. It's, it's uh, something was bugging me about that. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this painting has been sitting around for weeks and I've been waiting to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Great job on that one. Um, just because that was fun, I'm going <clears> to <throat> use it one more time. This is a painting, I don't know if you can see, there's a bird's head here where my thumb is going around. And uh, I didn't really like it in the end. So I did a lot of different processes to this uh, panel, making it darker and lighter and playing around with it, just having fun with no particular idea. But what really bothers me up here is this area where the legs of the bird are still visible. So I'm going to fix that and see what happens. So, this painting's far from done. <laughs> In fact, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm happier and more relaxed looking at it. And I love the, uh, the sense of movement that those lines create. I love uh, the sense of luminosity and light. You'll see in some of my other pieces where uh, I use repetitive line work like that to indicate light. And uh, so I'll hold on to that for another month or so. Shall we look at a few paintings? Yeah. Um, this is a painting of a swan. Um, my wife is English and we go to London most years, not this last year because we couldn't go anywhere. But uh, I love photographing the swans in the Thames River. And uh, this, this particular painting, I love. I have kept it around in my studio um, because I love the way that this big volume of this bird floats across the surface of the water, almost like it's and there's a simultaneity where it feels like it's floating across the painting as much as the water illusionistically that it's trying to represent. And the brushstrokes, indeed some brushstrokes uh, of the water uh, is uh, indicative of the, the material, the paint, as well as the illusion of water. Um, you can see the, the range of grays at the top is created by various applications of the white like we did on the dog. And uh, the linear aspect of it, I was drawing with the edge of the roller, um, not needing a brush, but just drawing with the roller itself. And then spending a lot of time with the exacto knife being intimate and delicate and careful to bring forth the feathers of the, the bird itself. And uh, that intimacy is important to me because I'm trying to create a, a sense of uh, empathy for animals, for other species. And I think that that, that drawing in of the viewer 
to such fine detail. Uh, I mean, it's intimate. It's, that's just the word. It's you're you're getting close and sharing sharing that that closeness with another species. I think that's incredibly important, and uh, it's it's definitely a constant theme in all of my work. And uh, there's a a process I go through designing the the position of the animal, the expression of the animal, where <clears throat> like a method actor, I try and become that animal and mentally, emotionally imagine what it would be to be that swan or that dog or whatever stag or whatever it is. I try and enter into that animal, not just copy the image verbatim like we were talking about earlier, but to try and sense what's most important about that physicality, that, that animal and what it's experiencing. And that, that trade, that back and forth in my imagination is ultimately what I'm communicating and encouraging the viewer to participate with. Let's talk about that one. <clears throat> this painting here is um, a painting of the sun. Um, some years ago, I was painting all these dark paintings and I thought, wouldn't it be extraordinary to try and paint the brightest thing in the sky, <laughs> to try and paint the source of light. Uh, I've been painting the effects of sunlight. Why not just go to the source and paint the sun itself out of the darkest material that I've ever worked with, tar. And it seemed enough of a silly idea that it was a good idea. And uh, so I began to think about what what the sun was. And this led to a lot of personal research, uh, reading about the uh, formation of the universe, uh, the way that um, stars are actually the processors of the, the chemical material of the universe um, that starts out with hydrogen and becomes helium and then becomes something more complex and more complex until these massive, massive nuclear implosions emit the very material that you and I and everything else that we know is made out of. Them. So that's why I have this little sign up here to remind me. This is the origin story of everything we know about life. So in making this, this painting, uh, I've made smaller studies of the sun, but making this one this size, uh, a little more than five feet square, I think, it has a, a visceral presence to it. When you stand in front of it, you, you can feel the energy of these fine details that I'm putting into it. And that, that relationship, it's, to me, um, this is almost like an altarpiece. It's a, a religious painting without the religion. It is my sense of, of returning to my source. And so it has great emotional meaning to me beyond being a hell of a challenge to do. I, I don't have any idea when this is gonna be completed. Uh, I spent, an entire morning right here, another morning here, another morning here, and there's a lot more mornings to, <laughs> to complete this piece, let alone deal with the corona of life that will radiate out from it. But uh, it's, it's an exciting process. Um, I use, again, photographs to inspire me. They're, pictures from NASA, when they photograph the sun, 
to look anything like this, they're filtering down so much. So parts of the sun actually appear dark and uh, it reveals this incredible energetic turbulence on the surface where uh, the sun being a mass of material that is being pulled by its own gravity to the point where it's exploding with radiance as the uh, nuclear fission breaks down the molecules of, of all of its components. Uh, the uh, energy is being radiated out and pulled back down by gravity. So there's this constant recycling of energy. And <clears throat> so there's this massive energetic looping constantly going on. And to me, that becomes also a metaphor for life itself. Uh, constantly recycling. We have a, a moment where we're a glory of radiance and back into the source of it all. So <clears throat> again, it's, it's a, a thing I'm trying to achieve beauty, but I'm also looking for meaning making this painting. Maybe I'll just look at a couple of these. I love getting to look at your artwork now, James, from after oh. understanding that each little line is an exacto knife and right. the process this takes to get that. I they're that much more beautiful than they were when I first saw your work. Thank you. The, uh, the challenge, of course, when you're doing things that are highly detailed is to be selective so that you don't overwhelm with detail. You have to find the story and detail the story and not the, the filler. <laughs> so deciding what to leave out is more important than deciding what to fit in. I have one comment for you that uh, Gary says he has enough trouble contemplating phalo blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is incredible. Another, th another thing you can, when you look at a wall of paintings like this, you might notice is for uh, as much brown as there is, it's tar after all, um, there's less brown than there is white or the appearance of black or close to black. And that's another uh, guiding method um, to try and avoid just the mush of the brown and try and get the dynamics of the dark and light. Um, one of my biggest um, heroes is uh, Goya and his etchings. And uh, I was really lucky as a little kid to get a bunch of books on Goya uh, and spent hours looking at them, not really understanding what I was absorbing. But now I can look back and go, ah, that's why I love black and white as much as color. Um, I find color sometimes now just a distraction is who needs it <laughs> i've got this full range between black and white i don't need to go to color to find range of emotion this texture and process that fill in those gaps for me so the tar right out of the um bucket is black yeah and so then how just by adding some sort of substance, you can thin it down a little bit to make the browner color and keep yeah, it's, it. But you have so it's, many variations of brown. It's, uh, it's the, not the, like black, brown, white. It's all different kinds of brown in there. Exactly. Um, tar, another reason I am interested in it, it's a petrochemical. It, this tar is the stuff 
that they pump out of the ground and refine into gasoline and fuel our economies with. And so the framework of this being an ancient material that's been around for millions of years. And it is also this material that is fueling the climate crisis that we're experiencing and changing nature uh, is the perfect parenthetic clause to put around an image of a cow or a rabbit or a bird or whatever emblem I'm using to indicate nature because it has this underlying framework of meaning. And while I find it beautiful and fun to play with, uh, I'm also trying to discover and say something about nature. What you're looking at uh, here is another series I'm working on that uh, uses uh, the sun and the stars, outer space, the darkness of space relating to the darkness of Tar, but I'm also using words into the composition. And uh, I'm an avid reader. I, I love poetry and words, and I get words stuck in my head. And so it's only natural that one day they would appear in the paintings themselves. This, this series started out with this group of paintings that says, words fail me, which is, is both ironic and true. Uh, and uh, this, this particular painting, the first of this series, has this oval orbit that might be hard to see on a screen like you're looking at this with, but it, it indicates the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And when I am reminded in my everyday life standing here in my studio, that I'm also standing on a little rock that is flying on an oval path around a nuclear implosion. Words fail me. Okay. And uh, I also uh, sometimes say, what could possibly go wrong? Probably everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working on a whole group of paintings that have um, deep philosophical meaning, but a certain sense of humor that relate to my looking at the stars from this delicate little point that we live upon. Uh, this, this painting here is called Frequently Asked Questions. And it's uh, inspired by that moment I experience every day of my life when I wake up dawn's early light and have to ask myself, wait a minute, who am I? What am I doing? And I essentially have to reassemble my sense of self every morning before I get out of bed and carry on with the day. And so I started wondering how many other people think these same questions and haven't they done it since the dawn of time? And so when I'm on the computer looking at questions and some logarithm sends me to frequently asked questions, I get so irritated <laughs> and I want somebody to answer my question. But here I am uh, in this painting at dawn's early light asking the philosophic questions of my life and there's nobody there to answer them but myself. And uh, so, it was worthy of a painting. Any questions? Wow. <laughs> yeah, really. That's well, a perfect way to segue to questions. <laughs> yeah, we are probably at that time anyway. So um, why don't we have, if you guys, I'm sure you have questions, because I think this is all fascinating. Um, you can turn on your cameras and turn on your uh, sound, and then uh, you can go ahead and ask James directly. James, Barbara speaking. Hi. Hello. Marvelous work. I'm so impressed. I have a couple of questions. Um, 
I, I also went to the art center school many moons ago. Mm. <laughs> Loved it, it's a great place, but uh, they're using a scrofito technique that I used to use a lot. Um, uh -huh. and, and I just wanted to define the term uh, for some people that may not be familiar with that. Uh, it's a great thing to do. I've never used it with a, uh, a, a knife, however, uh, but it's usable with so many different objects that are pointed in paintings. So it's, it's right. fantastic. Also, my last question is, when you were putting a, a plastic piece over the dog's face or part portion of it, uh, you were using a blue tape. Um, I have had bad experiences trying to do the same, but however, not on a uh, tar surface, but you were using titanium white on there too. Why, right. does it, why doesn't the paint pull off with the tape? That's, that's a good question. Um, I've used a lot of different tapes and I know, yes, um, tape can be just deadly to, yeah. I mean, you could destroy a Vermeer with a roll of tape. Um, yeah. You know, you, you have to be careful with the layers. I suppose I'm lucky that um, tar is a relatively tough material. I mean, they make streets out of it, don't they? Um, uh, we, uh, you, I use um, titanium, as you say, and I let things dry thoroughly. Um, I knew before I put that blue tape on there, nothing was gonna happen, um, but yeah, um, I, I've had accidents where I've destroyed <laughs> not just tar paintings, but my, my older paintings by accidents like that, yeah. So well, you can always fill yeah. it in later. <laughs> yeah, they always say test on the corner before you do this. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm brave, I guess I could fix it if I messed it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. If, if there's no other questions, I can quickly show you another little doodad or something, but. Uh, okay, well, maybe we'll let everybody leave your volume on or something and if you think of something go ahead and ask but uh okay. we'll just we've got a few more minutes and then we'll wrap it up so if yeah if you have anything else we can this this relates also to that thing you were asking at the very beginning about uh copying from photographs come over here um this this painting here you can show them that painting for a second and uh, wow. it's a, a painting of stags with their horns locked. And <clears throat> I've seen stags in action in the past, but never long enough or was I clever enough to take my own photographs and uh, make my own drawings on site as a plein air painter as these stags go at it. So I had to rely on the internet to find pictures that, of course, I did not want to just copy. So I made charcoal drawings that um, explored the dynamics I wanted to uh, express. And uh, I loved the tangle of the, the, the horns with the force of the animals behind that tangle and wanted to capture certain amounts of detail but wanted to simplify it. So charcoal drawing is a great method to explore form and, and decide what it is you actually want to express. Those are great. And, you normally um, do that, James, with every painting, before every painting, do a charcoal? No, no, it's, it's only when I just don't really know the subject that well. And uh, I haven't focused on a composition. Uh, you know, how, how did I want to zoom in on the action? Uh, if you look at photographs of the struggle between two stags online, there's almost always two stags on a horizon or something and you see the whole thing. I wanted to focus in and decide where that focus would be. So the, the image that's up on the wall here, uh, 
only includes one leg from each animal, but it creates this wedge, this V, this, this statement of putting their, their best leg forward and going at it. <laughs> and uh, so it became an essentialization of all the material I was looking at. And um, the, the one little uh, tip that I will leave you with, I used to te teach drawing at Art Center. And when I was uh, stretching my own canvases, I would always have uh, strips of canvas left over. And I just started rolling them up and realizing it makes a beautiful drawing material or drawing tool. So <clears throat> I'll just show you, this is a, yeah, I'll use this. You can buy a powdered graphite at any art store like Blick. And then you can draw with it, with this tool as if it's a big brushy. Beautiful. And then of course, the beauty of it is that you can take a kneaded eraser and draw back into it, erasing like I do making white lines with the tar and a blade. And you can see that the gestural force of it lends itself to an energetic image, uh, a simplification, a lack of detail, and it becomes a really super fun way to explore an image. Um, with one proviso, I used to teach a drawing class here in this studio. Um, and I had 10, 12 people all doing this process with powdered graphite. <laughs> and at the end of the night, oh my God, there was graphite everywhere. <laughs> so you have to be uh, a little cautious with the material because it is so uh, uh, powdery and, uh, and oily and... Uh, can be a real mess, but it has its advantages. Uh, don't do it in your living room. <laughs> um, James, yeah. did you start uh, with your basic oil paintings and, uh, uh, you know, like everybody else? And when did you finally but, get into the, the tar? Um, my, my career as, a, as an artist began at an early age. Um, my mom was a fashion illustrator and my dad was a photographer. So I had a strong visual environment. And uh, my dad had to go to work. He had a studio downtown in Long Beach. And my mom worked at home in a studio in the house. And uh, she, she needed to work. She had a four-year-old kid. And she said, Jimmy, I'm gonna make you a deal. I'm gonna give you all of the drawing materials you will ever want for the rest of your life if you'll just be quiet. <laughs> and I thought, God damn, that's a good deal. <laughs> and so uh, I started drawing under her easel by coincidence. Uh, this is her easel here that we're using as a table. And as a four-year-old, I'd be underneath that easel, drawing away, and uh, it worked. Uh, I was quiet, and I <laughs> learned to draw. I never stopped drawing, and I really did not have a choice as to whether I'd be an artist or not, because it was the only thing I really understood. Yeah. And, uh, it was in me from that early, early time. So um, I did go to Art Center. Uh, I did learn oil painting. I did learn all the fundamentals. But um, it wasn't really until I got out of school and questioned the traditions and said, no, there's another way to do it. I can, I can draw with a cement tool. I can draw with a belt sander. I can make paintings with tar. I can do this and uh, I, can, I can say more 
than I personally could have said with the traditions. And yet I'm relying on referencing the traditions. I, I still find it um, humorous that I can sometimes make something that looks like a traditional oil painting. It, it certainly refers to the masters, but um, it's made with these materials that have virtually nothing to do with the tradition. That are very 2021. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it gives me a, a sense of, of novelty, but it also uh, is uh, full of references that direct meaning for me. And that meaning is fundamental to making the work uh, that balances out the pleasure I have of getting my hands dirty like a little kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, um, I like that too. Well, it all shows in your work. It's absolutely beautiful. And we so appreciate you doing this for us today and taking the Thank time. You. And now I understand. I want to go back to your website and look at each image a little more closely. Thank um, you. And also, I want to thank Craig for being part of this and ask is, is Vermont Station open? Is it something we can do a Westlake Village Art Guild field trip? Sure. Or? Yeah, we're open. We're all open. Uh, most galleries are open Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to 4. Is it make an appointment or anything? Or no, is it we're all, doors are, doors are wide open. Okay, that's good to know. That's good yeah. to know. Thank you both a million times and uh, we will hopefully get to see more of your work in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us.